In the 1700s, Uniac Estates was the summer playground for Richard John Uniac and his family. He was once the Attorney General of Nova Scotia. 200 years later, this place has a beautiful museum, but also seven hiking trails that can take you throughout this magnificent property. And it's here that I'm on my walkabout today. Today's hiking trails on this estate range from under one kilometer in length to just over two and a half kilometers. You could easily spend much of the day hiking the trails here. Trails range from easy gravel ones to woodland pathways through more dense forest. Each trail helps tell the story of this estate. So this is the Martha Lake Loop Trail, and if I continue that way, it goes nicely right along Martha Lake. And you can continue that way and reach Drumlin Field Trail. I'm gonna head off this way towards the Red Spruce Loop Trail, which I'm only gonna use for a short bit as a connector to the Barrens Trail. All of these trails are well worth an adventure, but I can't do them all today. Uniac acquired a thousand acre land grant here in 1786. At the time, it already included frontage along Lake Martha here and a farmhouse. Now, over the next 25 years, he would grow this estate to over 11,000 acres. These days, there's only 2,300 acres or so left. That remaining estate is still expansive and is home to a variety of wildlife, diverse habitats, and distinct geological features. So Lake Martha, it's also called Uniac Lake, but the name Lake Martha is actually after Uniac's first wife. Now she died young, they had 11 children together and she died at 40 in 1803. Uniac chose this property for two reasons. One was the lake frontage. You know, that's not much different than today when people always want lake frontage. And the second reason was the property was located along the old stagecoach route between Windsor and Halifax. Now that route is a trail on this property that I'll reach later on. Uniac was originally from Ireland and his goal here was to recreate an Irish country estate and working farm. When the family first came here in 1790, they likely stayed in the original farmhouse. That original land did not include the property where the large home is today. But over the next two decades, he began assembling land to create the large estate. By 1813, he acquired a parcel from Charles Morris, which is where the large house and many of the buildings he would have constructed are located. Work began in earnest to turn this into the property he imagined. Work, which took only three years, ultimately created a property which included a large family home, many barns, a coach house, guest and bath houses, a hot house or greenhouse, and an ice house, and so much more. Once the property was complete, Uniac and his family saw this less as only a summer retreat and more their primary residence. While he still maintained a home in Halifax, this is where he spent most of his time living in almost semi-retirement until he died in 1830. Over his years here, Uniac planted hedges and lined the roads and opened fields with stone walls and majestic trees. Trees were also planted to create grand entrances to parts of the property. So this is where I'm gonna leave the red spruce loop, which would go this way and back along Lake Martha and back to the house. I'm gonna take the Barrens Trail from here. Stone walls have been discovered in what is now forest. This appears to support the idea that while Uniac cleared a lot of land, much of it has returned to the forest. Uniac had a dream that the estate would be self-supporting through agriculture, an important goal given the distance from Halifax and Windsor. 
But that goal was never realized as the land here really isn't suitable for farming. Nonetheless, even after Uniac's death in 1830, the home remained a popular summer getaway for his descendants for generations. Uniac's children followed a variety of paths in life. His third son, Richard, was a well-known lawyer and judge in the province, but he is perhaps best known for being part of the last duel to be fought in Nova Scotia back in 1819. His son, Norman, became the first Nova Scotian admitted to the English bar, and his son, James, was elected to the Nova Scotia Assembly in 1830, representing Cape Breton and ultimately became premier in 1848, leading the province into responsible government. Another son, Robert, became a Church of England pastor and built many churches across Nova Scotia, including one very close to here in Lakeland. He also established elementary schools for poor children of any religious background. Two of the daughters returned to Uniac House to live with their father after first traveling in Europe. One daughter returned to live in Ireland, the ancestral home of the Uniacs. With so many children, the family, both immediate and extended, was large, and this place was a focal point for a long time. I wonder what it would have been like in this area around the Barrens Trail when the Uniac family lived here. I'm traveling on the Barrens Trail, which is very much a connector trail through wilderness and marsh and brooks like this, Black Brook. And because I found Black Brook, it means I'm almost at the Wetland Trail. I'll be taking the Wetland Trail across to the Post Road Trail and back to the Uniac home. Well, this brings me to the end of the Barrens Trail, and I've reached the Wetland Trail. Now, I could go that way and take a hike of a few kilometers around some really nice wetlands and past Thompson Lake and Clark Lake, and ultimately end up at the Post Road Trail. I'm gonna take a shorter version of the Wetland Trail, this way, which will also take me to the Post Road Trail, but quite a bit further down and closer to Uniac House. As I mentioned, both directions will take you to that post road trail I'm headed for. If you just come out to do the full wetland loop, you can expect the whole thing to take about three or four hours, if you're doing it from Uniac House itself. It's well worth doing. You're likely to see not only brooks and lakes, but also a beaver dam and some massive boulders and semi-rare plants. But that's not on my hike agenda today. So I'm only going to be on this trail for a short while before I hit the post road trail for the final leg of my journey. So this is still Black Brook and as I follow the wetland trail, Black Brook kind of runs parallel to it all the way along. I'm almost at the post road trail. So this is the old post road trail. Now at one time this was the stagecoach route that went from Halifax to Windsor. That way was Windsor, that way was Halifax. This area is now called Mount Uniac. And in its time, that would have been a long and tough journey from Halifax. So the fact that Richard John Uniac was able to have a property right on the stagecoach line well, that was a symbol of his wealth and his prosperity and his importance to anybody that went by. The route is properly known as the Old Post Road because it was the route mail was transported along. It played a very important role in Nova Scotia's history. 
It originated as a Mi'kmaq portage route. Then the British Redcoats used this road to march troops in the 1700s. European settlers adopted the route as a stagecoach road for carrying mail by the early 1800s. Eventually, this route became Highway 1. In some areas, such as this, the highway now takes a different route. But in many places along Highway 1, the pavement is right over the old dirt routes stagecoaches once rumbled along. Back in its day, this road would have been quite a bit wider, 18 to 20 feet wider, but of course, the forest has grown in quite a bit now. In Uniac's time, it was popular for the upper class to establish country estates in Windsor. Windsor was becoming an important commercial center. It had a port, was a gateway to important and rich agricultural lands, and it boasted a protective military presence. When you come up the driveway of Uniac Estates Park, you are also traveling on what was once the old post road, along that former stagecoach route. You can still get a sense of the impression Uniac House would have left travelers with when it was built. Imagine the 1800s. This would have been largely in the middle of nowhere. Travelers, weary and tired, would have exited dense forests and bogs along a very rough road to see this majestic, well-kept estate with beautiful views across the lake and a grand home, surrounded by accessory buildings and guest and staff accommodations. These days, there's a tea room in the estate called the Post Road Tea Room, named, of course, for this road. You can imagine what this must have been like sitting or standing on the porch in the evenings, watching stagecoaches go by on their way to and from Halifax and Windsor along that old post road. This building, as majestic as it is, surrounded by outbuildings, the hothouse up in the orchard, barns, guest houses, an ice house, even a boathouse down by the lake that had an alley lined by trees. This would have been quite the place to be in its day. While some of the trails I visited today certainly have seen the lands reclaimed by the wild since Uniac's days, the Uniac Estate Museum Park is a rare example of an English landscape garden from colonial British North America that looks much the way it would have in the 1800s. Uniac was more than an upper crust political force in Nova Scotia. He was a gentleman farmer at heart. His passion and the reason he ultimately spent most of his time here was that he was devoted to clearing and improving woodlands and wetlands, experimenting with things like composting and growing a variety of agricultural and horticultural crops. His barns and lands were full of every sort of farm animal. In the hothouse, he grew exotic plants, a popular pastime for the wealthy in those days. Yet he never forgot his native Ireland. He planted acorns he carried back from Ireland, and the oaks from those acorns are still found on this property. So this stone structure doesn't look like much, but it was intended to keep sheep and livestock away from the house. Back in the 1800s, sheep were really important. This was before the days of mechanical lawnmowers, and so you had sheep to basically mow your lawn. But of course, you then didn't want the sheep and the cows and all the other livestock from getting up close to the house. So they built these walls and they dug a ditch. This part's been excavated a bit so that you can see where it is, but it would have gone all the way along here. And it prevented the sheep from being able to get onto the lawn where the English country garden was and where the garden parties were. Now they're called ha-ha walls. And there's lots of different stories about how it got its name, but perhaps the most entertaining involves women in their dresses as they were coming to the garden party. And they would not see this wall because of course, you can't see it very easily when you're looking from the house. And they would come along and they would trip 
right over to the wall and everybody at the garden party would laugh going ha 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 as they fell. I don't know if that tr story is true at all, but it makes for a good tale. There are lots of trails you can explore here at Uniac Estates Museum Park. You could spend all day really, and you could come at any season because there's snowshoeing and cross-country skiing on the trails in winter. Interested more in the history? You can check out the museum behind me or even stop in for a snack. Now my time here is done for the day, but after the break, I'm gonna be a little bit like Uniac himself and stick to the outskirts of HRM I'm heading over to Nine Mile River, where volunteers have created a beautiful trail network in a 1,000 acre wood. Won't you be mine? Feel the sunshine. trail map. Well, very close to Enfield in about 40 minutes up Highway 14 from Uniac Estates Trail System, you'll find the Nine Mile River Trail System. This is a beautiful and very popular trail network that's actually a set of three stack trails. And that's where I'm going on my walkabout this afternoon. This trail system covers about a thousand acres of forest. And this first trail is called the Pitcher Plant Loop. It goes both this way and this way. I'm gonna head up this way. It's the easiest of the trails, being so short and so close to the trailhead. The Nine Mile River trails are currently a network of three connected trails. There are plans for additional trails, and some of these proposed ones appear in the trailhead signage. Recently, the Nine Mile River Trails Association received $130,000 in funding to work on new trails and expand the parking area at the trailhead. This is where you could take the pitcher plant loop back to the trailhead. I'm continuing out on the Camo Lake Trail, which will take me to Camo Lake and the Hemlock Cathedral Trail. The Camo Lake Trail is an out and back. There'll be no loops here. While the land itself is crown land, this trail system is managed by the entirely volunteer Nine Mile River Trails Association. They work hard to improve this network of trails on a continuous basis, even adding in the odd whimsical feature along the trail. You can get involved. Over the past few weeks, volunteers have been out here putting in drainage, new benches, and new trail amenities for hikers, mountain bikers, and other trail users. If you visit the association's Facebook page, you'll see that this is a labor of love. Pretty much everything is done by hand. They ride bicycles or walk out to the working areas on the trail, move crusher dust by wheelbarrows to grade the trail, and build drainage, culverts, and bridges by hand. The Nine Mile River trail system didn't actually used to go all the way to the river. People used to take a short jaunt through the woods to get there. But this new platform has been built in the stairs, and here's the river. This is one of the new trails that's under construction. It'll be called the Witch's Cauldron, and it'll run right along Nine Mile River. If you're here on a mountain bike, the Trails Association has even put in some obstacles to have a bit of fun on. This trail isn't that far from civilization, but it is also in some ways remote. Cell service can't be relied on here. Fortunately, the trail is fairly easy to navigate with little elevation change. And the signage installed along the way is excellent, meaning together with the fact that the trail itself is obvious and well-maintained, no matter whether you tackle this in a muddy spring, on snowshoe in a snowy winter, or in summer, you're unlikely to get lost or even turned around. 
This bench along the Camo Lake Trail sits just above a low-lying wetland area. Now this bench is very popular with bird watchers because that wetland is home to many species of birds as well as other animals. This area is home to many of Nova Scotia's common species of animal, including white-tailed deer, raccoons, rabbits, barred owl, bobcats, and coyotes. From this spot, you can look down into a ravine along this trail, and if you followed this ravine down and bushwhacked through the woods, you would actually hit Nine Mile River. I'm sure that uh, when they build additional trails, you'll see more elevation than the current trails have. This is the first of two intersections between the Camo Lake Trail and the Hemlock Cathedral Trail. Now if I head down this way on the Hemlock Cathedral Trail, it would take me clockwise and back to this trail. But I'm going to meet up with it a little bit later on. I'm headed towards Camo Lake, which is 650 meters further down the trail. Camo Lake is not a particularly large lake, and it's shallow, but it is calm and a great place to view wildlife, if you have the patience. From frogs to birds and all sorts of other lake and forest creatures, the lake seems to be a meeting place for many of them. This is Camo Lake and the end of the Camo Lake Trail. We're pretty far from civilization here. There are no homes and no roads anywhere near here. I'm about four kilometers from the trailhead now, and my next stop, the Hemlock Cathedral Loop. The Hemlock Cathedral is, at least for now, an unmaintained trail beyond tree trimming and clearing the pathway. This trail is a two and a half kilometer loop, which eventually will take me right back to that first intersection I mentioned with the Camo Lake Trail. It's most definitely the most rugged of all the current trails, and it is challenging at times. Soaring hemlocks grace this part of the forest, and it's an increasingly popular part of this trail network. The Uniac Estates Trail System and the Nine Mile River Trail System both offer opportunities for anyone to go out on a hike, from short, well-groomed trails to woodland treks. Both are systems that I recommend visiting. Wherever your next walkabout finds you, I hope you take the advice of the famous Greek philosopher Pythagoras when he said, leave the roads and find the trails.